So let's welcome to the stage to talk about our search for extraterrestrial intelligence, Professor Mike Garrett. Thanks. So um, thanks, Laura, and thanks to all of you for, for coming along today. Um, I'm going to talk about SETI, and I'm sure that many of you know what SETI is. It's the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, it's a little bit different from most topics in astronomy in the sense that we've, we haven't detected any extraterrestrials. There's absolutely no evidence that there are extraterrestrials out there. There's, there's two guys in the back there that are maybe trying to prove me wrong. But a, apart from these two guys, I can assure you that so far, there's no evidence for extraterrestrials. But it's also true that three years ago, there was no evidence for gravitational waves. And so things change as technology gets better. Uh, and what I'd like to discuss with you is SETI, that it's a, a difficult thing to do, but technology is advancing, and we might be getting closer and closer, just like gravitational waves, to making that, I think, very important um, detection. So, first of all, I want to convince you that this is a, a reasonable scientific pursuit, that we can detect radio signals which are coming from very large distances. The physics says that that's possible. Um, and I also want to sort of discuss with you, you know, how likely is it that there are other technical civilizations out there um, that are sending either radio waves or other signatures of their presence that we might see in astronomical data. Just how likely is it that there are other technical civilizations in the Milky Way, our own galaxy, or in the universe. Um, and without giving the game away, I'll conclude that SETI is actually very, is likely to be very difficult. We know that in a sense already. We've been searching for these signals for the last 60 years or so. We haven't, we haven't detected them yet. But there are reasons to believe that technical civilizations might be quite rare. And so it's important, if we want to detect that signal, to th and if it's a rare signal, if it's intrinsically rare, then we need to think about what kind of technology that we would like to use in order to have the best chance of, of detecting it. So I'll talk about uh, how we can do better, um, what the prospects are for the future, and I think what's really important is that SETI, the whole idea of thinking about you know, other civilizations, life elsewhere in the universe, it, it kind of challenges us to think outside of the box. I think it challenges scientists to think in the, in the broadest possible way. And if you're into you know, SETI research, you find that there are people from all walks of life with all sorts of different expertise that can actually contribute to the discussion in very meaningful ways. And, and that's one of the things that I think is important. And it also gives us a perspective on ourselves, you know, homo sapiens, where we've been, and perhaps where we're going to in the, in the future. So I know it's always a mistake to show an equation in any presentation. So if you don't like equations, just ignore it. But the important take home point is there's a nice little bit of history here because when the telescope outside was built in the late 1950s, it was one of many radio telescopes, large radio telescopes that was being built around the world. And, and these two gentlemen, Coconi and Morrison, began to realize that if you took the Lovell telescope and you made a copy of it, and you put it on a planet around another star, then if the Lovell telescope transmitted a signal, it was quite physically plausible for that copy on another planet around another star to be able to detect that signal. So in other words, searching for artificial radio signals 
with these new radio telescopes as they were some 60 years ago was completely plausible. And even communication across very large interstellar distances was something that could actually be done. So in terms of the physics, it, it is completely plausible. It's very important that these two telescopes are pointing towards each other. If they're pointing away from each other, obviously it's much more difficult. And I'll come back to that aspect um, later on. So I'm not the only person that thinks this is plausible. People are investing a lot of money at the moment. A program called Breakthrough Listen. Um, this is an investment of $100 million in the search for radio SETI uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, it's been funded by Yuri Milner. Yuri Milner is a Russian uh, US citizen. Uh, he's no idiot, he's a billionaire, and he clearly believes that this is a program that's worth conducting both in the Northern Hemisphere and in the Southern Hemisphere. So, Many people believe that this is really a very interesting thing to do, and there is the potential for detection. Am I fighting against someone singing? Or? Okay. So, one thing that we can do is we can use our own spacecraft as tests of these very sensitive radio telescopes. Uh, and this is an example of the radio signal from Pioneer 10. And one thing that's really interesting about that signal is you'll see that it's, it's very narrow in terms of its frequency span, and that immediately tells you that it's artificial. It's being produced by technology because all the things that we see, the stars and the galaxies um, in, the, in the universe, they produce very, very broadband emission not this narrow band emission. So it's actually quite easy, in principle, to pick out these artificial um, signals. So, yes, the physics tells us that it's completely plausible to detect these signals across very large distances, even across the whole dimensions of our own galaxy, the, the Milky Way. But the question is, you know, are there other signals that are out there to be detected? Is it plausible that there are actually other technical civilizations? One principle which I think is sort of really important and one that has always appealed to me since I was a youngster is this Copernican principle, the principle of mediocrity, which says that there's nothing special about us that there's nothing special about our planet, the planet Earth, nothing special about the sun, our star, and nothing special about its position in the galaxy or our own Milky, Galax Milky Way galaxy itself. Uh, and I think that's an important principle. It's one that appeals to me. Uh, I, I feel it's a truth, a sort of fundamental truth in a way that I don't feel about other things. For example, religion. I spent a lot of time being taught about sort of religion, and it seemed like a very nice story, but it didn't seem like truth. And, and this seems like a real, a real truth, and it's it's something we can use to guide us in thinking about you know how we do SETI research. So astronomers use this this principle uh, of mediocrity all the time. So there's there's nothing special about us or our place in the universe. The physics that we um, discover in our laboratories, the physics that we make in the theoretical constructs, that we can take those and we can apply them to any sort of point in the universe, any location in the universe. And the physics that works here is the same physics that works elsewhere uh, in the universe. And we've been incredibly successful in being able to explain most of the physical phenomena that we see in the universe, stars, galaxies, the Big Bang, etc., just from these physical laws we've derived here locally. But, but what I think is actually really important is to see the bigger picture. So it's, it's not enough, in my view, to just think about astronomy as being from here upwards. 
that if we really want to understand the universe, uh, its nature, we also have to understand that there's life on this planet. And more than that, there's intelligent life. There's intelligent life all around us. And, and what does that tell us about the universe? If we don't understand whether that's a unique event or whether that's an event which is widespread um, throughout, the, throughout the galaxy, throughout the universe, then we don't really truly understand the universe. We can understand how the universe started with the Big Bang. But if we don't understand this particular aspect, we only see a small part of the, of the story. Another way of, of looking at this is that, you know, our physics uh, is very good at explaining the early universe. The, the universe when it was very simple and very smooth. But it's much more difficult to understand something like this. Anyone who's got a cat will know that it's a pretty complex thing. It's an intelligent being. And, and these things are equally important in understanding what the universe is and what is the nature of the, of the universe. Now, we know a lot more now than we, we knew 10 years ago, 15 years ago. One thing um, where we've made enormous progress is understanding you know, how many planets there are in the Milky Way, how many planets there are in the universe. And this spacecraft here, which is the, the Kepler Observatory, it's looked at lots of stars and looked for changes in their brightness due to planets passing in front of the, of the star. And what we know is that just about every star has a planetary system. This is what we know from these observations. It's looked at a tiny patch on the sky, but again, if we believe the mediocrity principle, that any patch of sky is just as valid as any other, then we can say that basically every star has a planetary system. So when I was growing up, that was something that we didn't know. Again, the principle of mediocrity made you think, well, you know, the sun's a star and the sun has planets going round it. So probably every other star has planets going round it. And that is, in fact, correct. But it's a big step forward because it means there are many locations around stars where potentially there's a platform where the conditions for life can be good so that life actually um, develops. So, is there life on any of these planets? Now, what I like about this question is that anyone can have an opinion on this topic. Whoops. Excuse me. So anyone can have an opinion on this. So your opinion is just as valid as your opinion, which is just as valid as your opinion, because we don't know. Astronomers don't know. Scientists don't know. Engineers don't know the answer to this question. And I think it's an important question. It's really fundamental to our understanding of the universe. But we can all have opinions about it. We have absolutely no idea what the answer to this question is, but I think we know that it's a very important question. What we do think, but we don't know for sure, but we do think that liquid water is probably important, is certainly for the development of complex life. That having liquid water on a planet, for example, that's one of the prerequisites for life to actually form. And we know that if we are very close to the star, if the planet's very close to the star, then it'll be too hot. If it's sort of very far from the star, then it's too cold. And if it's somewhere in between, this is the so-called habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone, then it's, it's just right. Uh, and this is the, 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 the location where water would be a liquid. If it's too hot, it evaporates and leaves the atmosphere. If it's too cold, then it forms ice. And what we know is that, for example, the Earth and also Mars in our own solar system are within this habitable zone. But there are also other regions of the solar system 
where we have the conditions where water is a liquid. For example, underneath the icy surfaces of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn are vast oceans full of water, more water than we have on this planet in some of these moons. So there are many possibilities for life to actually arise in our own solar system, and we can expect that to be the case in, in other solar systems. So from that point of view, one would think that there are conditions throughout the universe, throughout the Milky Way, where life, if the conditions are right, we might assume that life can arise. But we can also begin to sort of look at our own history, the way the Earth has evolved, uh, the way life has evolved on Earth, and we can also learn something from that. Even though it's just one example, there are some take-home points from the history, the big history of sort of the creation uh, of the solar system and the, and the evolution of life on this planet. So first of all, we have 14 billion years ago, the Big Bang, um, the universe is created, and in that process, after the universe expands, it begins to cool down, and the first stars and the first galaxies begin to form. And that happens about 100 or 200 million years after the Big Bang. Things are cool enough for hydrogen and helium to begin to condense into the first stars that then go on and form the, the first galaxies. What's very interesting is that most of the star formation in the history of the universe actually happens very early on in the, in the lifetime of the universe. So a few billion years after the creation of the universe, that's when most of the stars in the universe are beginning to form. And that's very important because it's those stars through nuclear reactions that produce all the elements that you see around you. Everything that you see around you in this tent, the steel, the person sitting next to you, the elements that form their body, most of that was formed in nuclear fusion within, a, within these stars. And most of this happened really early on in the history of the universe. So we've had the ingredients for life in the universe really early on. It doesn't just happen here when the solar system formed. There have been many solar systems forming all through co throughout cosmic history. And the ingredients have been there right from the, right from the start. So another sort of take home, home point from this big history is that we know from the fossil record here on Earth that life on this planet formed just about as soon as it possibly could. Once the sun had formed, there was a lot of debris that was left over. Some of that debris, the larger lumps, clumped together, and that formed the planets, the rocky planets in the interior, the hotter, the hotter part of the solar system, and the gas giants like Saturn and Jupiter in the outer part of the solar system. So the formation of the solar system occurred about 4.6 billion years ago, but the fossil record shows that life began about 4 billion years ago. So when things had calmed down, when all the other debris around the solar system, which was, of course was uh, colliding with the Earth, when that began to subside, things became a bit more stable, the Earth had cooled, oceans had formed, as soon as the conditions were right on this planet, very, very simple life was created. We don't know where, we don't know how, we don't know if it happened in multiple locations, but it certainly happened. And, and this early Earth, this is a very different place from where we are today, the kind of planet we have today. The moon was much closer, and there were two consequences of this. The first is because the moon was very close, the rotation rate of the Earth was much faster than it is today. So it took about six hours for the Earth to do one rotation four billion years ago when life was beginning on this planet. And it became, the day became longer as the moon moved further and further away to the 24 hour day that we have now. It must have been amazing because a rotation 
one rotation in six hours means that you could watch the sky, you could watch the sun, you could see it actually move across the sky if you look very carefully, quite easily. So the early Earth, the very different, very different place from the Earth that we have just now. And another consequence of the Moon being so close is that the 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 tides, so the the ocean tides were enormous. The tidal effects of the moon were much, much stronger because it was closer to the earth. So the, the sea level between high tide and low tide, which you know might be a few meters depending on your location on the planet today, it would be many tens of meters, even hundreds of meters uh, four billion years ago. A completely different planet and only very simple life. So no life that you could see with your, with your eyes. Microscopic life was the only life that was on the planet and probably in the oceans. So that's an important take home point. Um, the other thing which is very important is that more complicated life, so life made up of cells, multiple cells, not just single cell life that appeared really quite quickly, but multicellular life. We have to, we have to wait about two billion years before anything semi-complicated arose on this planet. So we had early life very soon after the planet formed, but we actually have to wait a long time before we even get multicellular organisms. Now, of course, it's an example of one, you know, maybe different on other planets, but I think that's, that's really quite interesting. The other thing that we know, if I just go back, is that really complicated life, so life that we would recognize here, people, animals, plants, trees, etc. This only happens in the last 500 million years of the history of our planet. And the other thing we know here is that it's accompanied by mass extinctions. So there's been five mass extinctions, major mass extinctions over the last 500 million years, where most of the species on the planet go extinct. We are, we are most familiar with the last, last mass extinction. We know more about that, obviously, than the others, where the dinosaurs became extinct practically overnight. You know, one day they were there, and the next day they were gone once an asteroid had impacted. A lot of dust had gone into the atmosphere. There were fires across the planet. So the dinosaurs probably died out from a combination of those fires, but also the fact that all the dust in the atmosphere cooled the planet very quickly. And they were so big that they couldn't survive. The only survivors were the really small mammals. And of course, we know that they eventually gave rise to hominids and eventually um, homo sapiens. The other take, point, uh, take home point is that sort of a modern civilization, not even a technical civilization, but a modern civilization, one that can write and read and can record its history, that's only the last 10,000 years. So it's a tiny fraction of the evolution of our planet where we've had the ability to, for example, search for SETI signals or even send SETI signals um, using uh, our own technology. So two sort of main points. The first is that life begins just about as soon as it possibly can on this planet. And that might be telling us that at least very simple microscopic life might be quite common in the universe. But the other thing is that intelligent life, and in particular a technological civilization like our own, has really only arisen in the last hundred years. It's a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall history of our planet. And that might be telling us that intelligent life is actually very rare. Uh, not only here, it only happened here after four and a half billion years, but it might be rare overall in the Milky Way and in the, in the universe. So there's, there's something else which makes this really quite difficult. And that is that the Milky Way is really, really old. The Milky Way has been around for a long time, about 10 billion years. So it's, it's really big. And the speed of light is actually very slow. I mean, we think of light as being almost instantaneous. 
you know. If I make a move, you see it straight, straight away. But actually, the speed of light is actually rather slow when you're dealing with these scales and these dimensions. So that it takes 120,000 years to go from this side of the galaxy to the other side of the galaxy, traveling at the speed of light, which we believe to be you know, the fastest speed that you can possibly go from the laws of, um, from the laws of physics. So that makes communication between civilizations in the Milky Way really quite difficult. They're separated by enormous distances and they have to appear at exactly the same time in their, in their own history in order to be able to detect each other. Uh, and, and that just makes SETI real. You can have civilizations coming and going all the time throughout the long history of the Milky Way. But if they're only around for maybe a hundred years or a thousand years or 10,000 years, then the, the chances of them actually overlapping is, is actually quite small. So SETI's pretty tough. And I think we know that it's tough also, not just from radio observations, but also from looking at astronomy across the whole electromagnetic spectrum, we don't see any artifacts in our astronomical data that would suggest that an advanced civilization, for example, is modifying our data. And we might expect that. For example, we know from our own experience that as a civilization advances, it typically uses more and more energy. At the moment, we sort of exponentially require more and more energy to do all the things that we want to do. And one of the byproducts of that is that you pr produce a lot of waste heat, you know, with your laptop, for example, or your mobile phone. If you use it a lot, it gets very hot. And that's just the basic law of thermodynamics and physics. It's very difficult to somehow cover this up. So if there really are technically advanced civilizations out there, this is one of the signatures that we would expect. And there are other signatures across the electromagnetic spectrum that we are looking for in astronomical data, but we don't see it. So this is the most recent observation using the, the Gaia spacecraft looking for so-called um, Dyson spheres. And the, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think the solar system is a huge disappointment. Yeah. Every time a spacecraft goes and looks at another planet or another moon, you know, there's absolutely no evidence that there's ever been any life on those planets, that they've ever been visited by other civilizations. The solar system is absolutely pristine, apart from any of the other rubbish that we might have left behind. But there's no garbage from any other technical civilizations, and in principle, if you're a, an advanced civilization, there's no reason why you can't go from one star to the next. You know, the physics says that that's completely possible. So SETI, I would say, is difficult. How can we make it easier for ourselves? Well, there are two obvious things. Now, my colleagues, astronomers, are, are really focused on sensitivity. They really think about sensitivity, and we've made enormous strides and sensitivity over the years. But it's not all about sensitivity. It's also about this thing called field of view, and that's how much of the sky can you see instantaneously. Now, the Lovell telescope, big telescope out there, can see roughly just a bit less than the, the size of the moon when it does observations. So it's a tiny, tiny fraction of the sky. And naturally, that reduces your chances of being able to detect a SETI signal because we don't know where SETI signals are likely to come from. So if you're only able to observe sort of very small areas of the sky, that's, that's making our job even difficult. So lots of progress on sensitivity, exponential progress in fact over the last 60 years. But in terms of field of view, you know, we've maybe got a factor of 10 or so better but actually, compared to sensitivity, it's really been pretty poor. So one of the things we are trying to do is to develop technologies, uh, first of all at low frequencies, but we'd really like to see those at much higher radio frequencies, where the noise from the galaxy is much less. We're developing technologies to do that at the moment. And so 
This will be important so that we can observe much more of the sky instantaneously. This will hugely increase our chances of being able to detect a SETI signal in the future. And I think what is also going to be important is not just single dishes, single big telescopes, but arrays of telescopes and combining the data from those telescopes. We do that with the E-Marlin telescope here in the United Kingdom, where we're combining signals together. That's also, in my opinion, a very important technique for SETI. It hasn't really been used for SETI so far, but I believe it offers a lot of advantages. And I'm actually working on this just now, so I want to show you a real sort of SETI experiment. Um, this is actually data taken from the European VLBI network of a, a patch of sky that includes many stars and many galaxies. Um, we've just taken data from this star down here, looking for narrowband signals. So what we're looking for is a kind of bright flash coming from, from, from these maps. This is chopping through frequencies, many, many frequencies, one after the other. Um, and unfortunately, I have to disappoint you and disappoint myself by telling you that there are no such signals. But this is a, an interesting way forward, I think. And also another thing which I'm really interested in is actually doing SETI with objects, targets that are really, really far away. SETI is kind of also obsessed by looking at nearby stars. But I got to the point where I think we have to really think out the box. We have to do things that are almost crazy to be able to make this detection. And one of those things is actually expanding the volume of the search space. And that means looking at more distant uh, objects in the future. The future would be a combination of both of these techniques, the interferometry and the wide field of view offered by Aperture Array Technology. And that will be the future of the SKA. We're hosting the SKA headquarters here, just about half a kilometer away. So we're really at the heart of all these developments here at Georgia Bank. So very quickly, I want to tell you why I think SETI is interested in terms of how it challenges our sort of preconceptions and our, our biases and makes us think, um, I think, beyond our, our own expertise and makes us think in a, in a multidisciplinary um, way. But one thing it makes me think is this principle of mediocrity, for example, the Copernican principle, does that really apply? Does it apply to intelligent life, for example? Perhaps there is something special about us and our place in the universe. I think the best case is that we are waiting for some kind of technical breakthrough. You know, the gentleman here is uh, Anthony van Leenhoek. He was a, a Dutch amateur scientist. When people were building the telescope to look at stars, he discovered and built the, mi the first microscope. And with that microscope, he opened up a world that we were completely unaware of. The microscopic um, bacteria that are all around us, but which we cannot see, he discovered this new world of life. The life which has been dominant on this planet for billions of years was only discovered a few hundred years ago when this gentleman invented the, the, the microscope. So we, sh we, we shouldn't be so arrogant to think that we have the technology to do this. Maybe there needs to be a breakthrough in technology. Maybe, maybe we are just not up to the job. You know, we share 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees. We don't expect chimpanzees to be able to understand general relativity. We don't expect most humans to understand general relativity, and I include myself in that. So maybe we're just not up to the job. Maybe we need help. And maybe the help is coming in the form of artificial uh, intelligence. And this is definitely, at least for me, the worst possible case, that we are actually alone, that we are the only intelligent life in the Milky Way, the only intelligent life in the universe. To me, that would be an a credi incredibly lonely, disappointing, and sort of very sad possibility. Or are we waiting for another kind of breakthrough? Not a technological breakthrough, but some kind of ethical breakthrough or even a spiritual breakthrough that, that somehow allows us to join this galactic club. You know, maybe we're being shielded from the others. I quite like this 
cartoon. I, I won't read it out except the first bit. They aren't civilized yet. They have wars, they have politics, they have poverty, they have religion. Maybe we are just not mature enough to go out there and engage with life that might be all around us, but we're just too dumb and too stupid to be able to see it. I like Arthur C. Clarke's quote, which I think takes us from both extremes. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. First of all, just to, to, rather to, to, to finish off, I want to talk about our future. It's quite possible that technical civilizations like ourselves are very, very short-lived, that we, we don't know how to actually be sustainable. We see this every day. We see it with all the, the challenges that we have. You know, maybe this is just a phase that we're going through, and maybe it's a phase that we don't recover from, that technical civilizations, that the challenges that are facing us in the future are challenges that we might not be able to overcome, and there are many of them. You know many of them. Population growth is still not under control in many areas of the world. We are pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at an unprecedented rate. Uh, it cannot be that this does not have an influence on climate. It cannot be. This must have an influence on climate. So there are many things, many problems facing, facing humans. We are exponentially using the resources of this planet, but this planet is finite. You know, it has a certain size. We cannot continue to use resources as though it was infinite. If we do that, then our lifetime as a technological civilization can be very short. The dinosaurs were in a different position. They didn't know that they were about to undergo a mass extinction, but we have all the signs that if we don't become sustainable in all these different ways and all these different factors, then the same fate may be approaching us and it may come sooner rather than later. So we have a chance to do something about that. Um, this is the last couple of slides. We have to take better care, I think, of our planet. We need to take better care of each other. And that's not just our families and our friends, but that's actually everyone on this planet. You know, we are all members. We're all on this planet. We are hurtling through the Milky Way. We are going in orbit around our sun every year. We make a full track with this beautiful spaceship, this fantastic spaceship that's out there. It takes 250,000 years to go around the galaxy. We need to take care of it and we need to understand that we are a species on this planet. We have to share resources in order to have a, a future and to be sustainable. So um, I'll leave it there. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for listening over the last 40 minutes or so, um, and I'll leave you with some conclusions. Thank you.
Um, I mean, so it's, it's a very good question, and I can tell you that people that do SETI, for example, um, the community is really split down the line, so maybe half the people think that we should be sending messages out, and the other half think that that's probably a bad idea, Steve Hawking uh, being one of those. Um, I have to say that um, we're already sending a lot of signals out into space. So the Deep Space Network, for example, that sends instructions to the, you know, to the Voyager spacecraft and to, to um, New Horizons, etc. Um, the Arecibo Telescope that does a lot of ionospheric um, work, sending very powerful radio beams. All the military radar systems and the civilian radar systems at airport, airports. So there's a there's a huge amount of radio waves, very powerful radio waves and quite narrow band going, going out there. So personally, I think if groups want to send signals, I, I don't really have a problem with that, but I don't find it very scientific because none of them come back. If you send a, a signal to a star that's maybe 10 light years away, they don't come back after 20 light years and see if they've got a, a return message. So I don't think METI, which is what you're talking about is very scientific, but I don't think it makes any difference in terms of making us more visible to other civilizations out there. I think that's a, that's a really interesting thought. Um, who knows? I mean, you could be right. I mean, there could be other civilizations out there on other planets that are maybe quite similar to periods in the past, the past history of the Earth, like the Egyptians or the Romans or like ourselves. It's, it's completely possible. I imagine that they might be a little bit different, that all those histories will be you know, maybe similar but different in some way. But you know, you know, maybe dinosaurs, for example, roam other planets. Maybe dinosaurs is quite a common sort of life form on other planets. Maybe humans are not. Maybe we are just one of those flukes that just happen. But dinosaurs are common. Uh, maybe technological civilizations, you know, with mobile phones and laptops. Maybe that doesn't happen very often. You know, we had a long period where humans really. Um, we're doing the same thing for, you know, 200,000 years before they started to domesticate animals, before they started to do agriculture. That's only happened in the last 10,000 years. So, you know, all these things are possible and, and your opinion and your ideas are just as important as anyone else's because no one knows. So all those things are possible. That's the thing that makes this so interesting. So, so no, I don't think it's actually happened. Um, I know some people who are scientists who have tried to investigate some of the more interesting claims, and all of them that I know have, have come back and said that they, they, they couldn't find any evidence that these things had, had really happened. Um, personally, I think if there were UFOs in the sky, the fact that we all have mobile phones, um, I think there would be much better evidence now than there was 50 years ago. You know, the peak in UFO activity happened just after the Second World War. It's pretty much located to the United States and the southwest of the United States, and it kind of grew from, from there. But it's probably, you know, we have more and better technology now. And I haven't seen anything, any video from a mobile phone or any images from mobile phones that would convince me that any of these events have really happened. And I think we're much better equipped to provide much better evidence now 
than 50 years ago, but the evidence isn't any better now than it was 50 years ago. So no, I don't, I don't believe it, no. Let's wait. I'll try and get everybody in, but my selfie skill's not that good. There we go, pick up a little bit. Oh, hang on. There we go. Yes. Cool. <laughs> Thank you guys.